So probably the most basic test for uh, strength of a material and how it, a material acts under loading and stress is a stress strain test. So what you do with this uh, test is you take a sample of the material, commonly called a coupon. Coupons are long, thin samples. They're milled down, in, in the case of the coupon on the right, to a small rectangular shape. Uh, the one on the left there is a cylindrical shape. And they're milled down and smoothed out so you don't get any stress concentrations on them. And then what you do is you take this cu these coupons and you put them in a tensile tester. A tensile tester is a very strong hydraulic machine with gripping jaws. And what it does is it pulls the coupon apart. While you're pulling it apart, you also measure the uh, elongation of the sample. And you collect that data and put it on a graph. All right, and so your, your goal here is to fail the material, to actually tear it apart. And while you do it, you measure the load, which gets you the stress, and you measure the elongation, which gets you the strain. So you can see there the two marks on that middle sample that were placed a standard distance apart. And then at the end of the test, those marks could be measured to get the actual elongation. Although actually in the, uh, in the normal test, there's what's called an extensometer put on the samples to get you a real-time reading on elongation. So you measure the load you apply and how much the material stretches out or lengthens out. And then from that, you can calculate the stress and the strain on the material as it's uh, pulled apart in a failure. And then you can graph that up and read the graph to get information about the material. So there's the graph. That's on page 125 of your notes, I believe. So what we have here is a typical graph. Now, an actual material might act a little differently than this, but, but this gets you some idea what the important points are in the graph and how a material would act, typically. So you start off with no stress or strain. So you start off at point zero, zero. On the y-axis, you have stress, the load over the area. That's the Greek letter sigma there for normal stress or axial stress. On the x-axis, you have the strain, which is epsilon. That's the Greek letter that looks like a backwards three. And that equals delta, the elongation, over L, the original length. So that goes on the x-axis. So what happens here is you start pulling on the material and you start applying stress to the atomic bonds that hold the material together. You can think of the bonds as being like springs. So for the first phase of this test, you have a linear relationship between the, the load and the stress and the elongation and the strain. So that's what occurs initially with the sample. It's like you're stretching out the bonds. They're acting like linear springs. So the harder you pull, the more elongates. And that's a linear relationship. All right, so what that gives you then is a nice predictable relationship between the stress and the strain. And this is a linear portion of the graph. It has a fairly constant slope, which is called E, the modulus of elasticity. So if you take the change in stress over the change in strain, which being as you're starting at point zero, zero, is just the stress over the strain on that part of the graph. What you get is the slope of that line. And that's E, the mod modulus of elasticity. Now, this is the area where you typically want to design when you're building structures and, and mechanisms and things. You don't really want to go off into this area because if you do it, uh, the material becomes much less predictable. You can't really tell exactly what's going to happen. So design stays in this safe area where the loads are relatively low in comparison to the ultimate strength of the material. And also there's a very defined relationship between stress and strain. The upper region of that area there is the proportional limit. The proportional limit, proportional meaning a linear proportion between stress and strain, that's the upper limit. So this is the area for which E holds for the material right in there. Once you get beyond that, you start stretching those springs out a little bit too much, the, the springs being the analogy I'm using for the bonds, the atomic bonds. And you start getting into a little bit of a 
nonlinear relationship, the graph typically starts to flatten out. You start to get extra deformation for increasing load. Now the next point up the graph is called the elastic limit. Now as long as you stay within the elastic limit, when you unload, the material will return to its original shape. The loading and unloading curves follow the same path. Once you go past the elastic limit, what you get is what's called a permanent set in the material. So if you go beyond the elastic limit and then unload, you won't return on the upward run of the graph. You'll come back over to the right there and you'll end up with a little bit of a permanent set in the material. Okay, so that's the elastic limit. The next point is called the yield point. Now the yield point is uh, when you actually start tearing the atomic bonds apart and the material really starts to deform quite a bit for a small increase in load. The best analogy I can give for that is like a balloon. If you ever blown up a balloon, initially it resists quite a bit, but then you hit a certain point where it really starts to expand rapidly. Okay, and that's kind of analogous to yield. It's not the same phenomena by any means because the yield is when the atomic structure, and actually it's a crystal for a metal, not as clean as a crystal like a diamond or something, but it is a crystalline formation. When you really start pulling on that, you start moving the atoms ar around in that formation, that's, that's yield, when you're really starting to get quite a bit of given the material for a small increase in load. Now within that crystal, you have imperfections, lines that are uh, kind of fracture lines. They start moving around. Now eventually with this yield phenomena, you'll hit a point where those fracture lines start running into each other. They start intersecting each other. That will harden the material up a second time. You'll get a second rising limb of the graph. Okay, and that's called strain hardening. Now, when that starts happening, pretty soon after that, you'll get a phenomena called necking, where the material will actually get narrow at a given point, and all of the yield will occur right in that area. An event, and so necking would be when the sample of the material actually bows in a little bit like that. And you get all the uh, deformation occurring within this region here. And eventually the material will fail. Now when you get into that necking phenomena, what happens is you can't uh, very easily track the cross-sectional area anymore because this uh, dimension here is changing quite rapidly as it necks. So if you are able to track that cross-sectional area, you could track the actual stress. And you would have a rise in actual stress until the material fails. Okay, now keep in mind, as this area decreases as it necks, the stress goes up for a given load, okay, because stress is force over area. So if you were able to track that cross-sectional area kind of real time as it necks, the stress would go up. Now that's very difficult to do though. So typically what they do is they use what I call the nominal area, the original area, because it's just too hard to track the, the changing area once it starts ne necking. So the original area, if you use that in your calculation, that'll get you the nominal stress. And the nominal stress then actually drops off because it doesn't account for that decreasing of the area. So eventually uh, the material will fail then. So that's a typical stress strain relationship there. Now in truth, I've kind of compressed the graph. An actual graph, you'd have a pretty linear region. You'd get some kind of a long flattening out yield phenomena, and then perhaps a little bit of a jump there until failure. But I've kind of compressed some of that to get that uh, typical graph that I'm showing, just so I could label everything and get it reasonably on a piece of paper. Now, some other materials don't have much of a yield at all. Brittle materials like glass or cast iron, they'll fail quite rapidly. They'll just kind of go up a little bit and then break. So, you know, how these materials act just depends on the nature of the material, how flexible and ductile it is, okay? Now the yield point can be pretty hard to identify, so there's kind of a standard way to do that. So keep in mind that the yield point is right here. 
past the elastic limit a little ways. That's the point when the graph really flattens out and at which the material will have quite a bit of deformation for a little bit of extra load. It can be kind of hard to identify this point when you're testing actual samples. So there's a standard way to do it that's used across the industry so that everyone calculates it in the same fashion. It's called the 0.2% offset method. Okay, so 0.2% in decimal form is 0.002. So to do this method, you start at a strain of 0 0.002. Okay, and that's delta over L. So if you're, when your delta over L is 0 0.002, you mark that point on the uh, graph. Then you draw a line parallel to the rising limb of your graph and see where it intersects after your graph flattens out. So you're drawing a line parallel to the rising limb of the graph. You're going to intersect it right up here. And by definition, that's the yield point by the 0.2% offset method, or you might call it the 0.002% or 0 0.002 offset method, whatever you want to call it, 0.2% or 0.002. All right, um, so that's just a little introduction there to the graph um, that's used to describe materials with axial uh, stress and axial strain. Now I've got three videos there in Moodle, so please have a look at those. And uh, so why don't you pause the recording here and then look at the videos, and then after you've done that, come back and we'll, uh, we'll go cover just a little bit more. All right, so what I wanted to cover, hopefully you've looked at the three videos now. Now keep in mind that, you know, especially the one from uh, the first one there, the longer one, um, they were using some different terminology than we use. They also, I thought a little oddly, were plotting up not the stress and the strain, but they were plotting up the load and the deformation. Uh, the typical way to do it is actually to use stress and strain there, okay? Now for homework that's due Friday, and I think that would be the 11th, wouldn't it? Yeah. Okay. I'd like you to do 102, 103, and then 111. Now, 111 might require a little bit of explanation here. What I'd like you to do is to use a spreadsheet or SciLab or MATLAB to do it. Um, remember to convert the force into a stress and the deformation into strain before you make your graph. So I give you two columns of uh, force and deformation. So convert force into stress and deformation into strain. And then plot, plot up the data. The stress goes on the y-axis, the strain goes on the x-axis. So I'd like you uh, to do that. Now if you're using Excel, use a scatter plot to plot the data. Don't use an xy plot. The graph will not have the proper shape if you use an xy plot. So use a scatter plot. I'd like you to list the answers to the questions in a box at the bottom of your plot. You can also, and I'd like you to use that 0.2% offset method to get the yield stress. Okay, so you can draw this parallel line in by hand. You don't have to do that in Excel or MATLAB or SciLab. You can do that by hand. And then remember to answer the questions that I asked there and box those in at the bottom of your graph. So I do want you to list your answers for the modulus of elasticity and the yield stress and the, uh, I can't remember what all I asked you there, but there, there was a few different uh, things that I asked you to, uh, to calculate up. So just remember to do all those things and put them in at the bottom of your graph. So what you're turning in then is a plot. I don't need the actual code that you used or the, the software, the, you know, the, the computer file. What I want is a plot, okay? All right, so here's number 111. It's on page uh, two of your uh, packet there. So here's the data, so the load and the deformation. Give you the uh, original gauge length, which is the, the sample length, and then the diameter of the sample. So again, use uh, MATLAB, SciLab, or Excel and come up with a 
graph of the data, which ought to remember to convert into stress and strain first, so that should look something like that. And then give me your values for E, the proportional limit, the yield stress, and the ultimate stress. Box them in and put that right on your plot. What you're turning in is not, again, the, uh, the code or the, the, the file. It's just a printout of the graph with the answers on it. I give you some sample answers. And I also give you the final answers for the problem. Now, you might get slightly different answers than me, and that, that's fine. There's no problem with that. It's a graph, and we're all reading it as best we can. Now, here's that 0 .0002%, or excuse me, 0 .002, 0 .0002, yeah, 0 0.002, which is the 0.2% um, offset line. See, I just drew that in by hand. It was right there. So, um, so there you go. So that's so those three problems are due on Friday. So 102, 103, and 111.